Can computers feel emotion? Probably not, at least at this time. But what would it take for them to feel emotion? Does that really matter in order for the computer to be able to generate work which makes us feel emotions? So I've kind of been on a kick over the past few months of creating computer-generated work. I'm starting to think that maybe you can have these unfeeling devices which can create work which makes you feel something. And so today I want to keep experimenting with that. I want to play with poetry. And there's one poet in particular that I want to play with, Shakespeare. So today I'm going to see if I can write a program which writes poetry as Shakespeare might write it. And we're going to see if it means anything at all or if it just feels nonsensical. So I want to start off by explaining the theory behind what we're going to be doing here. And if you don't have a computer science background, don't worry, you can still understand. Because a neural network is actually a pretty basic thing at a high level. What you actually essentially have in a conventional neural network is just a transformation of information. So you're starting at these input layers with some information, say the pixels in an image. And then you pass that to what are known as hidden layers, where you're doing some sort of transformation, some math, where you're you know, compressing those pixels and looking for patterns and so on. And you have a number of hidden layers like that. They're connected to each other. They you know, pass information forwards. And then you have finally output layers where what you're looking for gets outputted. So if you're trying to figure out if there's a cat in an image, for example, part of your output layer might be, is cat true false? And the way that the network gets smarter is through a technique called backpropagation, where you take your error function, essentially, you know, how right the network is or how wrong it is, and you use that to adjust the weights over time. But critically, what this misses is it misses sequences of data, which is really important for language tasks. So to understand why this is important, let's consider the task that we have at hand. So let's say that we're given some character, A, and we're trying to figure out the letter that is most likely to come next. Well, there's, there's any number of letters which could really come next, right? Many words start with A. It could be, you know, A-R for R, A-T, A-M, A-N. There's, there's a variety of letters which are relatively likely. And so in a conventional neural network, you'll choose one of these, maybe the most likely one, but you're not going to get a word out of it. But the power with language comes when you think about the previous letters. So let's say that you start with, instead of A, a, B, S, T, R, A, C. What's next? Well, probably a T, because you're going to make the word abstract. But if you just put into a conventional neural network the letter C, the last letter, you're not going to get a T most of the time. And so you're not going to get an actual word most of the time. And so considering the history, considering a sequence of data is really powerful. And that's what something called a recurrent neural network allows us to do. So without making it too complicated, a recurrent neural network passes its hidden layers as input along to the next step. So you actually get this kind of historical sequence of data along with your current input to help you make better informed decisions about what your output should be. And if you want to know more about this, I've linked a really good walkthrough of what an RNN is and why it's powerful in the description. But all that you really need to know for the video is that an RNN is really powerful for language tasks because it considers the history. So if you train an RNN on a corpus of text, say all of Shakespeare's text that we have from him, and then you feed it in a word, say Romeo, then it'll be able to predict the next characters and, and it can build its own little body of text just by predicting and, and by considering the previous letters and figuring out what is most likely to come next. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take Shakespeare's entire corpus, feed it into an RNN, and out of that RNN, we're hopefully going to get this text that looks Shakespearean, but is not actually in the corpus. It's not actually something that Shakespeare wrote. And then with that, we'll be able to turn it into sonnets by following Shakespeare's sonnet form. So up to this point, I've literally just been copying the code for the tutorial that TensorFlow put out for a recurrent neural network. It's great. It works really well. We, we, like you just saw, you know, we're getting text, which sounds kind of Shakespearean, 
but now it's kind of time to take it to the next level, to go beyond the tutorial. What we really want to do is start taking sentences which mean something out of this. So I'm going to generate a large corpus of text out of this, and then I'm going to start analyzing that text using some linguistic techniques to look for syllables, potentially to look for rhyming, and then assembling them together. This library that I found, the Big Phony Library, saved me so much time. It's literally one line import one line find syllables, incredible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate a bunch of output and then I'm gonna pull all of the 10 syllable lines from that, creating hopefully something which is, I don't know, maybe 500 lines or so that we can start to draw from and start to put together. Okay, so Shakespeare's sonnets all kind of follow the same formal structure. It's three quatrains, so four lines uh, with two couplets A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, followed by a couplet G, G. And when I'm saying A, B, that, that's talking about the rhyming structure. So the first line rhymes with the third, the second line rhymes with the fourth, and, and so on. And then the last two lines rhyme together. And so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take the lines that we have. We have about 497 lines which follow an iambic pentameter, kind of an iambic pentameter. It's a stretch to say that, but they have 10 syllables. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the rhyming ones, get all the possible combinations, and then compose some sonnets in the form of Shakespeare. But yeah, for now what I'm gonna start doing is find out which lines rhyme with one another and then start to encode that into the formal kind of sonnet structure that Shakespeare has. So what I did was I went through every line that had 10 syllables and I just went through all the other lines and saw if they rhymed and I just created a dictionary of these rhyming pairs or rhyming combinations rather and you can see, offender, he is gone and let them good, bear mighty, Lurk Fowler, to the fish, wood. The Duke is done, be burnt for the time, wood. You know, they rhyme, they don't make sense, but they rhyme. And so with that, all that I really had to do was create a really simple function for generating a couplet where I take two lines which rhyme but are not the same line and put them together. And then from there, generating a quatrain is very easy. You generate two couplets, you offset them with one another, and then generating a sonnet is really easy because you're generating three quatrains and then a couplet, you're putting it all together. And so with that, we were generating Shakespearean sonnets. So we've got actual sonnets coming out now. It's looking great. Unfortunately, I had fewer lines than I thought. I thought that I had 497, around about 500. Turns out I have less than 300 when you take out duplicates. I was generating duplicate lines because I messed up when I was writing the program. I didn't know if it was running or not. And it was, and it was just appending the same thing over and over. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna clear slate on that. I'm just gonna start over fresh. I have to go work out. So I've got a few hours that I can just let this program run. So I'm just gonna run it to generate more text. We'll generate a bunch of sonnets, maybe format some of them which are nicer. And we'll see if we actually have anything meaningful or anything that evokes any form of emotion. program is done running. I modified it a little bit just now actually to uh, write all the sonnets that it's generating into a file. So a text file that we're getting all the sonnets from. What ended up happening was I got 25,000 characters for each of the starting phrases and there's about eight starting phrases, so about 200,000 characters in total, which gave us about 600 uh, phrases with 10 syllables each that we could then find rhyming phrases and piece together using the Shakespearean sonnet Form. And I think, hey, you know what? Let's do a little dramatic reading of those sonnets to, uh, to really set the mood and to figure out whether or not this actually means anything. Okay, we got the, the spooky lighting activated. Here we go. This one I think is my favorite. I, I did a quick read through all 50 that I generated. <clears throat> but little face to fawn by parting is. Whoever able, she will not be slain. With patience for our offense with his, his light hide foul wings, that profiter's pain. But if you know's defending of my son, to trust the truth of it, tell me in my... Meet him, adieu, leave up as thou wert one. Be shrew or foe, sir, tell the people's eye, call the unspeak of the sleep, monstrous me, I have no knee. The cape up forth in heart, these garments are in a moname and free, a bitter criking chopples of one part which often hust work, wizard lay in thee, the mayor of sweet world, with death may be. I have no idea what that even means because it doesn't mean anything, so it's really hard to figure out how to pronounce that. Let me turn on a non-creepy dramatic light and get, get rid of, whoa, that's bright, get rid of the red. I think pretty much mission success. Like I'm pretty sure that 
these actually, like, as I was reading them, some of them were intriguing. I started to share them with some of my friends who are Shakespeare fans, um, you know, drama kids, whatever. And they were kind of into it too. Like, it's kind of cool. This stuff excites me. I don't know why. It's so cool to imagine a computer coming up with this. And this is actually a computer coming up with it. This is actually like, okay, read all of Shakespeare through this very, you know, rudimentary neural network and then try and write it yourself using literally character association. I'll start you off with the word Romeo and then you have to figure out what comes next. And it writes real sounding Shakespeare that actually kind of means something when you put it together properly. That blows my mind. That's so cool. I will never apologize for being passionate about something like this. I think that this is the best way to have spent a day, not even a day, an afternoon, writing code and, and generating sonnets and, and reading them and, and just having fun with, with I don't know, thinking. It's, it's cool. I enjoy it. So if you want to check out the code for this, if you want to play with it, it's on GitHub. You can check it out. Link in the description. Also in the description is my Instagram, which I, you know, post on semi-regularly, although I'm not a big social media user. And yeah, feel free to like and subscribe if you want. Leave a comment. I hope you enjoy it. I hope this is a fun video for you. Hopefully I was able to explain it without losing you along the way. I'd now like to thank Audible for sponsoring this video. And as many of you will know, I have had Audible and Audible subscription for well over a year now. It's been the only place where I've gotten audiobooks. And I've been listening every month. I've been using all of my credits and I find it to be a really good addition to my life. I use it when I'm walking, when I'm commuting, if I'm ever driving somewhere, if I'm doing dishes. I use it all the time. In my opinion, one of the most compelling features of Audible is that all of the audio content is read at such a high level. The recording quality is amazing and the voice actors are fantastic. And that leads me into my recommendation for this month, which with a video that deals with Shakespeare only feels appropriate that I choose a Shakespearean recommendation. And I'm going to recommend to you this fully dramatized version of Hamlet because Shakespeare takes on an entirely different meaning when you hear it aloud. Having an audible, a fully dramatized version of Hamlet is a fantastic way to get into it. And you can listen to it for free if you go to audible.com slash johnfish or text code johnfish to 500, 500 And what this will get you is a credit for any audiobook in Audible's massive collection, as well as two free pieces of Audible original content with a 30-day free trial. If you go to audible.com slash johnfish or you text code johnfish to 500, 500 Like I said, I've used Audible for a very long time and it has been an awesome thing for me. Hope you enjoyed. Have a fantastic day. I'll see you soon.